communities in Atlantic Canada. This ferry, which is the longest running salt water service on the continent, is a physical and a historic link between Halifax on the one side and the city of Dartmouth on the other. The story of the founding and the development of Dartmouth is a fascinating one. It's one of adventure, pioneers, of visionaries, of people of widely varying backgrounds of industrialists who manufactured everything from chocolate to ice skates. There was the leader in the field of folklore preservation long before that was fashionable. And then there were the gutsy entrepreneurs who took on the magnificent task of building a canal right across Nova Scotia. Throughout all of this, the single most important influence was the abundance of fresh water in the saltwater environment of the Atlantic. So, let's go ashore. Let's take a closer look at this place they call the City of Lakes. Coastal cities acquire a patina, a weathering that distinguishes them. Harbor sounds, salty air, a song woven into day-to-day -day life. Dartmouth is like that. The people. Coastal cities possess a uniqueness of individuals who seem to take on the lore of the sea. A few are salty, some dynamic, others adventurous, playful. Dartmouth has been home to many like that. Take, for example, Owen Soller. A top rower, he has coached some of the best. Working out on Lake Bunuk, one of many within the city, today he's on the family crew, three generations. And at age 85, he's hard to keep up to. My father was a great rower, and uh, I suppose probably the best way is explaining to say I probably cut my teeth. My eye teeth on the butt end of the north. I like competition. I was very competitive. I like competition. In the same way with the Rhone. Uh, if I lost the day tomorrow, I was going out and I was going to win. I didn't know what it was to say, well, there's no good in me going out in this race today because there's other crew that I'd be rowing again is better. I was very fortunate to row with good men, and we were very successful over the years that we rowed. Since his youth, Soller has been inspired by many, like local boy and world champion George Brown. All out determination to beat the record caused him to burst his heart in a match in Halifax Harbor at the turn of the century.
Once the summering grounds of the Micmacs, Dartmouth Cove has harbored a lineage of vessels without interruption since the first European presence. It was along this shoreline that General Wolfe practiced his troops for the second siege on Louisburg. The eastern side was traditionally the favored Anchorage Basin, protected from southeast gales. It is here where the fresh water of the Shubenacadie meets the sea that the story of Dartmouth begins. General Cornwallis came in 1749 to establish a British garrison in what was then called Shabakto Harbor. It would be a counterposition to the French foothold on Cape Breton Island. Cornwallis ordered his charges to get a sawmill going at the cove where water power and timber were plentiful. From here would come the planks to build Halifax, while a tiny cluster of shacks housing soldiers and workers surrounding the mill became the heart of the Dartmouth settlement. The fortress at Halifax as a naval and military base guaranteed the sea routes to Europe and defined what the English called Nova Scotia, a territory in dispute since the Treaty of Utrecht was signed between France and England in 1713. With the threat of French reprisal, pressure mounted to populate the basin area. August 1750 saw the ship Alderney drop anchor in Mill Cove and set ashore 353 men, women, and children, the nucleus of the city of today. The period between the 1780s and the 1830s was vital to the development of this fledgling community. First came the Nantucket Whaling Company, and many of the people connected with the whaling industry were Quakers. They would influence the architecture, they laid out the street patterns, and they created a common, which at the time was pasture land. Some of that pasture land is parkland today. The whalers had moved from Massachusetts after the American Revolution in order to continue business under the British flag. Dartmouth's first major industry, the whaling boats would venture on journeys to the coasts of South America and Africa. Their impact was brief, however. Within seven years, heavy British duties forced them back to their Welsh homeland. In the solitude of Christchurch Cemetery, the old Quaker burial ground, internationally known painter Tom Forrestal sometimes pauses to reflect. I've lived in Dartmouth, of course, for years and years and years, and uh, it, I find it's a, a great place to live in. The idea I work with are the universal things that fit in with anybody, any, any place they go. So I paint the bigger idea. If it's, there's not a bigger idea there, to me, it's not worth doing. Uh, the painting here in the graveyard, uh, a lot of people see them as a negative thing, but they're not. They're incredibly, they're incredibly interesting. Even this one here, some of Dartmouth's greatest citizens who in the past are here, all about us. And uh, there are memorials to them and they're fascinating. The idea, the bigger idea, always uh, fascinates me more than just the visual effect of light, or sunsets, or what have you. Three years ago, the, the uh, harbor was clogged with ice. And I uh, had gone down to the harbor to look at it, and fine, it was quite remarkable, really. I was quite impressed. But only when I drove down to the end of the, uh, to Hartland's Point, to the end of the land there, the mouth of the harbor, uh, something struck me. I saw Devil's Island, the, the little houses and so on on the island, and the lighthouse and so on, and all this ice around it. And there instantly was this bigger idea that I come back to. Uh, people's isolation, how they cut themselves off, and the precariousness of life, and so on and so forth, loomed up before me. So I just had to do it, and a large painting came out of it. 
Uh, Dartmouth is very much home or family oriented town as far as I'm concerned. And we had a large family, Natalie and I and six children. And uh, it, uh, it was a great town to bring the children up in because there were lots of families around, I think. And I think the family unit had, uh, and still does, has a great value in Dartmouth. And uh, that means a lot. The Micmac Highway, between the inland wintering grounds and the sea, gradually gained attention. And not only as depicted here for sheer pleasure on a hot summer day. Within a few years of the startup of settlement, Captain William Owen recorded a journey through the passageway. It soon became of strategic importance as the main source of fresh water for the British Navy base. Mixed with the ingredients of entrepreneurship, the Shubenacadie waters would grease the wheels of industrialization at the Cove, commencing in the period following the signing in 1814 of the Treaty of Ghent, which brought an end to the battles that decided Canada. With the native people as guides, the Nova Scotian interior gradually came to be charted. This, coupled with a burgeoning Dartmouth community, fueled enterprising dreams. By the early 1800s, local merchants saw a chance to capitalize on the canal building fever of the times. The prospect of an inland water transportation route connecting them with the settlements along the shore of the Bay of Fundy, just 100 kilometers away, captured their imagination. It would eliminate that dangerous sail around Cape Sable and open up the interior. On July 25th, 1826, on his way to launching Upper Canada's Rideau Canal, Governor General Dalhousie turned the sod for the Shubenacadie system. After 35 years of engineering and financial problems, the steamer Avery opened the route. Access to resources created a boom but within a decade, railway competitors killed shipping traffic with a fixed iron bridge across the ditch at Waverley. Sid Gosley. The Shubenacki Canal was really what brought the people here, and it really started the development of, of Dartmouth. The Nantucket whalers had come and they had gone. Uh, there was only a very few people here, really. In fact, there's 35 houses in Dartmouth when the canal started in 1826. By the time it had finished, and it was out of, uh, you know, the whole thing had collapsed by 1871, there was something like 350 houses here. And uh, there was a very strong uh, population of, of workers who were crying out for work. See, there was no unemployment, no, nothing like this. There was no social security, anything. These guys either worked or they starved to death. Manpower churned out an eclectic mix of product, beer for Susanna Olin's brewery, rope for the Consumers Cordage Company. The workforce crafted schooners and processed their cargoes of molasses, cocoa, and chocolate. In John Starr's nail factory, a man named Forbes worked long through the night on an inspiration that would swing the company's fortunes. In the early days, they were all stamped Halifax, although they made it Dartmouth, because Halifax was, by then was a city. It was the capital of Nova Scotia, and, and Dartmouth was basically the little bedroom, if you like, but uh, we did have these small industries. Well, the star wasn't too small. There were gold medals for its exhibits in Philadelphia in 1876, at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893, and again in Paris in 1911. The Star Manufacturing Company, Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, really put the community on the map with the right idea at the right time. The invention of the day, these fancy spring skates that simply snapped on your boots. Well, they far surpassed these old wooden jobs that were held on with leather straps. Up until the time they stopped making them during the Depression, millions of these wonders of technology gave folks around the world a new outlook on winter sports. Over 11 million pairs of the blades were stamped out on the assembly line in the first 30 years of its existence. Star would pay out over a million dollars in wages to keep teams in the win column and bonuses in the pockets of the Harbor Town's workers. The 
Winter became a new season of industry. The lakes gave rise to ice cutting outfits like these, which fed shipping and industrial needs, not to mention the ordinary kitchen ice box. The winter harvest would not only produce a bounty of ice and timber, but would also yield a gold mine of material which extolled the human experience. Documenting and recording this lyrical bonanza became the self-assigned task of one woman. Clary Croft is a folklorist and performer. A tremendous amount of the fishermen who worked on the salt bank schooners going to the Grand Banks and, and going to the West Indies would go to the lumber camps in the wintertime. And there, people in the lumber camps used to have song contests, and they would try to sing each other out. And sometimes you could get people to sign on in a lumber camp if you told them that such and such a person was going to be there because he was such a popular singer. You're going to be entertained all evening long. It, it must have been a wonderful experience to go and, and hear that kind of material. Born in Dartmouth in 1899, Helen Creighton would leave the nation a treasure earned by her single-minded mission. Helen uh, was a pioneer in the field of folklore, studying folk songs, uh, ghost stories, the supernatural. She had a tremendous vitality in it and a tremendous need to, to experience new and exciting things. And growing up in Dartmouth in the time that she did, she had the opportunity to do that. One of the interviews I did with her, I asked, I asked her what she felt was the most important work she did. And she said, I saved the material, and now I'm giving it back. And it's up to other people to do something with it. And that's the important part of a heritage. You, you, can, you can do anything you want to with a house and make it look pretty, but if it doesn't reflect the life. And that's why she was so pleased with what was happening in Dartmouth. Dartmouth was trying to do that. Dartmouth was trying to reflect the life. And she was thrilled when the museum took over her house and decided to reflect this, the city that she was so proud of. She would always correct people in an interview, oh, no, no, I'm not from Halifax, I'm from Dartmouth. It was a big point. She was very proud of this town. Oh, what have you in your bag? Oh, what have you in your pack? Tied up all night to the child on the road. I've got a little primer and a little bed for dinner. Cried the pretty little child, only seven years old. Right from the early days, people worked in Halifax came home to bed, <laughs> if you like. But I mean, the ferry was the, the car. All roads, if you like, lead, led and do, even today, lead down in some ways to the ferry. Like a weaver's shuttle plying to and fro across the harbor. Getting to the other side is irrevocably a part of the Dartmouth story. 1752 marked the beginning of the water link with the transport of mill workers and lumber to Halifax involving locals like Samuel Cunard, who went on to hold sway over a shipping dynasty, the saga of the ferry tells of inspiration, sadness, and of Lee Cockian episodes, like the time residents, after vying for control of the service, gathered at the docks to await their new acquisition. Author Joan Paisant. The boat started to come in the dock. It was just getting dusk. The chief of police was down there, and he said, stand back, stand back. That wharf is meant to hold a crowd of people. But they were so excited, they absolutely refused to go back. And the first thing, this little flimsy wharf collapsed, and a crowd of people was thrown into the harbor. And people on shore began throwing things in that they could grasp. And several of the people in the water were knocked unconscious. Finally, everybody was out, but nobody knew if anybody had drowned. And in those days, when everybody wore hats, all these hats were floating on the water. So they were taken out and ranged along the seats in the ferry. And crowds of people went through identifying hats. Unfortunately, that, that it was a bad beginning because four people had been drowned. For two centuries, prior to the first bridge across the reach, this all-important link transcended the era of paddle, sail, horsepower, and the internal combustion engine. 
the lifeline of the harbor. It is the unbroken tie that has spanned the reach of time, witnessing its joys and sorrows. Like the time tragedy hit Dartmouth on the morning of December 6, 1917, the Belgian relief ship Imo collided with the Mont Blanc, carrying 2,600 tons of high explosives, resulting in the greatest man-made explosion before Hiroshima. As I walk out one evening fair To view the fields and to take the air I heard a young man sigh and say I've lost my darling Phoebe When the traditional singer sang a song They were singing their life they knew the people intimately. When William Riley from Cherry Brook, just outside of Dartmouth, would sing songs of slavery, a member of the black community, his, his ancestors came up here as slaves. He would have to stop in the middle of singing because the tears were streaming down his face. Walter Roast was a, a, a postman. People sort of used to make fun of him, old bachelor. And all of a sudden, he was invited to come up to Halifax and Dartmouth and sing on the radio. Well, his songs were important again. They were part of the community, something for the community to be proud of. It, it gave people that validity of saying, my life was important. The lives that the early people lived were important. Important enough for somebody outside the community, like Helen Creighton, to come in and say, I don't want to know how you're like me. I want to know how you're different and what makes you special, and what makes you unique. Helen Creighton died in December 1989. Her legacy lives on. Coastal cities are more than salty air and harbor sounds. Coastal cities, the people who pioneered them, lived them, loved them, while becoming a part of that patina, know who they are. The people of Dartmouth are like that.